and insight into the various aspects of life. He has been instrumental in transforming the way of thousands of people, the way they look at life. He has helped build their self-confidence, inner strength, and spirituality. Dr. Zacharias has spoken all over the world for the last 43 years in scores of universities, notably Harvard, Dartmouth, Johns Hopkins, and Cambridge. He has addressed writers of the Peace Accord in South Africa and military officers at the Lenin Military Academy and the Center of Geopolitical Strategy in Moscow. He has twice spoken at the annual prayer breakfast at the United Nations in New York, which marks the beginning of the United Nations General Assembly each year as the 2008 Honorary Chairman of the National Day of Prayer, he gave addresses at the White House, the Pentagon, the Cannon House. He has had the privilege of addressing the National Prayer Breakfast at the seats of government in Ottawa, Canada, and London, England, and speaking at the CIA in Washington, D.C. Dr. Zacharias has authored and edited over 20 books, including the gold medallion winner, Can Man Live Without God? Several of his books have been translated into Russian, Chinese, Korean, Thai, Spanish, and other languages. His weekly radio program, Let My People Think, airs on 2152, 2152 outlets worldwide. His weekly program, Just Thinking, on 721. And his one minute, Just a Thought, on 488 channels. Born in India in 1946, Ravi migrated to Canada with his family 20 years later. He has been honored with the conferring of six doctoral degrees, including a Doctor of Laws and a Doctor of Sacred Theology. Dr. Ravi Zacharias is founder and chairman of RZIM and it is headquarters, headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia with additional offices in Canada, India, Singapore, the United Kingdom, the Middle East, Hong Kong, Romania, Turkey, Austria, Spain and South Africa. Dr. Zacharias and his wife, Margie, have three grown children. They reside in Atlanta. We welcome you, Dr. Ravi Zacharias. after an introduction like that. <laughs> Please don't go and get a second opinion or you might be very disappointed. It's very, very kind of you to give me those kind words. I'm not worthy of them. Uh, actually, it throws me off many of the things I'd like to say, but you're very kind in your tributes. It's all been by the grace of God. One credential I don't have is having graduated from St. Stephen's. <laughs> The reason I never graduated from here is because they would have never let me in. I was not bright enough, and that's a fact. 
It was my dad's dream for me to get into St. Stephen's, but I gave my father more nightmares than I actually <laughs> gave him dreams. I wasn't smart enough to come in here, but God has a sense of humor. He brings me in as a guest speaker. <laughs> so if anyone of you is not doing very well, if anyone of you is not doing too well, don't lose heart. One day you may be standing here. <laughs> introduction will be universally proportional to your real capabilities. Uh, thank you, Professor Varghese, for honoring me, sir. It's truly my distinct honor to be speaking here. I know of your reputation, and I know what an outstanding institution this is historically. And for a long time, I've been looking forward to coming here and addressing this uh, gathering. I'll leave tomorrow for Chennai. And today we'll have the privilege of speaking at Madras Christian College. Have I done so? Have I not turned it on yet? I thought I did. Maybe not. I'm technologically challenged. <laughs> Got it? All right. I was certainly there we go. Which did you prefer? Would you prefer the other one? Yes. That's what I thought. I hear you all so clearly. Now maybe this is purposely done so you won't hear what I'm saying. Uh, do we need to have this or can I go back to that? Let's go back to that, yeah. I go to Chennai from here tomorrow and then speak at Madras Christian College in Thangram. Uh, my honor to be there because my brother graduated from there, my father graduated from there, and my grandfather was a professor of English literature at MCC Thangram. I didn't graduate from there either, but I'm just uh, happy to be going back and having the honor of speaking then on to Mumbai before heading on to three other countries and then finally home. The 18th century Scottish political activist Andrew Fletcher made the comment thus, he said, let me write the songs of a nation. I don't care who writes its laws. Let me write the songs of a nation. I don't care who writes its laws. Because oftentimes in music, in lyrics, in poetry, we are more likely to unveil our souls than we are in any prose fashion in a class in philosophy or ethics or whatever. Growing up in India, of course, a lot of my philosophy came by way of music, as most young people gain their gleanings from. I'll never forget listening to the song, Na Me Bhagwan Hoon, Na Me Shaitan Hoon, Dunya Jo Chahe Samjo Mato, Insan that's what we are talking about today. What is the meaning of being an insan? Nama Bhagavan, who I'm not, I'm not God. Nama Shatan, who I'm not Satan. You can choose whatever you wish. I'm a human being. That's the essential question of life. What does it mean to be human? But then there was another song which deals with the existential issues. Dunya mein hum aaye hain to jeena hi padega. Jeevan hai agar zeher to pina hi padega. If I've come into this world, I've got to live. If living means drinking poison, I'm going to drink it. And those are the twin forks of reality, piercing the head and the heart. What does it mean to be human? All other questions are answered on the assumption that this first one has already been answered. And then existentially, when you're looking, especially as waves of fatalism come over you, and the haunting question of meaning and purpose and why am I here envelops your soul. It also assumes that the essential question has been answered first. You know, the story is told of a guy who was feeling a little thirsty and so he challenged a mate of his and he went this way. He said, look, I'm gonna ask myself a question. If I answer it, you buy me a Coke. I said, what did you say? He said, I'll ask myself a question and if I can answer it, you buy me a Coca-Cola. <laughs> he said, that's ridiculous. He said, no, 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 no. Then you ask yourself a question, and if you answer it, I'll buy you a Coca-Cola. And we'll keep going like that till one of us asks ourselves a question we can't answer. I thought, is this the strangest bet I've ever heard in my life? If you ask yourself a question, if you answer it, I buy you a Coke. I ask myself a question, if I answer it, you buy me a Coke. We keep going till one of us asks ourselves a question we can't answer it. So got it. So, right, since you asked it, why don't you go first? So the fellow says this, how does a rabbit burrow a hole deep into the ground without throwing mud onto the outside? 
He says, this is my question to me. How does a rabbit burrow hole deep into the ground without throwing mud onto the outside? He said, my answer is, it should start digging from the inside. The other guy said, how can it do that? He said, I don't know, that's your question. <laughs> Sooner or later, we ask ourselves questions that stump us. That's one of the blessings cricket has given to us in a language or a metaphor like stumping. We get stumped with our own questions. We're outside the crease and we're out in just trying to raise the issue. The Judeo-Christian worldview defends its precepts and its beliefs in that the person and work of Jesus Christ is not only authentic in its existential expressions, but also in its essential answering of our questions. And so what I want to do this afternoon to you, ladies and gentlemen, is try and answer for you how the Judeo-Christian worldview answers the question, what does it mean to be human? You see, when you are checking truth, the greatest challenge of your life and mine is to be truthful to define truth. And when we define truth, we are really talking about it in two prongs just as well. Single questions dealing with particular propositions test truth in correspondence. When you're in a court of law and you're answering a series of questions, every one of your questions is measured against correspondence. It's, uh, it's the aspect of truth that's called the correspondence theory of truth. A particular assertion corresponds to reality as it is. But when a series of answers have been given, then we look for the second test of truth, and that is coherence. Not only must individual answers correspond to reality, but our cumulative answers must be coherent if the worldview is to be consistent. That is the great challenge. I remember speaking at the University of Iowa once, and I was talking on a search for coherence in culture. And at the end of my talk, a young woman ran up to the microphone, she cupped her hands, and she literally shouted at me. She said, who in the world told you that our answers needed to be coherent? Where did you get this from? She said, is this not another Western idea foisted upon the rest of the world that our answers needed to be coherent? And I've learned if you allow a questioner to talk long enough, they really convict themselves. And so I let her talk. And finally I said, ma'am, I'd be happy to answer your question if you will answer just one of mine. I said, do you want my answer to be coherent or may my answer be incoherent? <laughs> the whole audience there at the University of Iowa burst out laughing. I said, no, 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 no. Please don't laugh at her. I want to hear what she has to say. Is it okay with you if my answer is incoherent? She stood there silently and walked away. She knew she had just stumbled over her own words. We look for coherence in counter perspectives. We look for coherence and correspondence in counter perspectives. Oftentimes, we can become incoherent ourselves. Many years ago, one of my favorite authors, Malcolm Muggeridge, made this statement. He said, it is difficult to resist the conclusion that 20th century man has decided to abolish himself. Tired of the struggle to be himself, he has created boredom out of his own affluence, impotence out of his own erotomania, and vulnerability out of his own strength. He himself blows the trumpet that brings the walls of his own cities crashing down until at last having educated himself into imbecility, having drugged and polluted himself into stupefaction, he keels over a weary battered old brontosaurus and becomes extinct. That was over 40 years ago that Muggeridge made the comment. Just a short while before that, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., when he received the Nobel Prize for Peace, said this, I refuse to believe the notion that mankind is mere flotsam and jetsam in a river of life. I refuse to believe that mankind is so starlessly bound to the midnight of racism and war that the end of that, the day, bright daybreak of peace and brotherhood can never become a reality. I believe, said he, unarmed truth and unconditional love 
will have the final word in reality. I believe on armed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. Mugridge, he keels over a weary battered old brontosaurus and becomes extinct. Martin Luther King Jr., unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. So here's my question to you as young bright minds. What is the single governing discipline in our worldviews these days? It's the sciences. That's what we are told. If you were to listen to Stephen Hawking, he's given all the answers. And we don't need to look to God anymore. Once upon a time, in this brief history of time, in the last page, he said this, I've now told you what, if I could tell you why, I would have the mind of God. But in his more recent uh, book, as he published it, you know, he they basically said, we've got all of the answers in the sciences. Now, I ask you this, if we live with a scientific single vision, and we live within the orb of naturalism, what in the exact sciences defines for you and me unarmed truth and unconditional love? Where do we get these imperatives from? If our entire framework is naturalistic, if the sciences reserve that autonomy and superiority over all other disciplines, because Hawking in his, in his book also said philosophy is dead. It's dead. And so, if philosophy is dead, and naturalism and scientism becomes the governing worldview for everything. I ask you, what does unconditional love mean? Where do we get it from? What does unarmed truth mean? You know, it all goes back to a very important answer to the question, what does it mean to be human? Who are you? Who am I? What does it mean to be the human being? Ravi Sakharas. And I want to give to you as quickly as I can the answers from the Judeo Christian worldview. The first answer comes to us in that we are here by design, we are not here by accident. We are here by design, we are not here by accident. We are not just a, a blip on the radar screen of time. We are not the random collocation of atoms. We are here by the designed will of a creator which gives to you your intrinsic worth, your intrinsic dignity. You see, we talk so much about human rights, we talk very little about the right to be human. And the reason we don't talk much about the right to be human is because we don't know where it leads. How do we really define what it means? In the biblical framework, there are two implications from the created order. Number one, you have intrinsic worth. And number two, you have reflective splendor. Intrinsic worth and reflective splendor. There is a splendor that we reflect and there is a worthiness that is essential to you and me. It's not given by state. It's not given by governments. It's not given by some de facto laws. It's given to us by the creator himself that I have no right to violate your intrinsic worth. You are created, the Bible says, imago Dei. You see, two things happen in a conversation with Jesus. A man came and asked him a question, and the reason he asked him this question is because Moses had given 613 laws. David came around and reduced them to 15. Isaiah reduced them to 11. Micah reduced them to 3, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before your God. So this man comes to Jesus and he's actually pitting law against law. And he looks at Jesus and he's asking him a trick question. Which is the greatest commandment? Which is the greatest commandment? You know, Jesus could very easily have given him the greatest commandment, but he gave him two. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and all your strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He said, on these two commandments hang all of the laws and the prophets. Because of the first, the second necessarily follows. Without the first, the second is with its feet firmly planted in midair. You need the foundation. You need the grounding of the vertical, the transcendent, the sacred, because of that, the horizontal follows. To love the Lord my God with all my heart and soul and all my strength and to love my neighbor as myself. You see, I have no right to violate you. Whether you agree with me in everything or not has nothing to do with it. I have no right to violate your sacredness. 
And this was given so clearly in the immediate next question. The man comes to Jesus and says, is it all right to pay taxes to Caesar? You know, on April 15th, we pay our taxes in the United States. And every time April 15th comes, I wish Jesus had answered this question differently. <laughs> <laughs> is it all right to pay taxes to Caesar? And Jesus looked at him and said, do you have a coin? The man said, yes. He said, give it to me. He said, whose image is on this coin? The man says, Caesar. He said, Jesus said, give to Caesar that which belongs to Caesar. And give to God that which belongs to God. The man should have had a follow-up question. The follow-up question should have been, what belongs to God? And Jesus would have said, whose image is on you? You see, on the coin is Imago Caesar, Caesar's image. On you is Imago Dei. And so even your very motto points to the glory of God. And your life had better be in keeping with that motto of that vertical dimension of the glory of God. Amen. I had never realized this in my own life. I was saying it tongue in cheek, but it was really not tongue in cheek. I was a loser, I was a failure. I had no interest in studies, I had no interest in the academic world. And I ended up at the age of 17, what used to be called the Wellington Hospital here in Delhi, on a bed of suicide. I had no desire to live. And there, on that hospital bed, for the first time in my life, a Bible was opened to me. I had never cracked open a Bible in my life. I had no such interest in anything spiritual. But now with a dehydrated body and the poison that had sapped me out of everything, even the moisture within me, so that I had no strength to even lift my arm up, there were needles into me pumping all that uh, glucose and all of the other moisture that I needed. And when the Bible was brought to me, I couldn't hold it, and it was given to my mother, and my mother had to read it. This morning, my sister is here at the audience. This is the first time she's come here after nearly half a century of her life. We all grew up here. And she's here in the audience. She flew in from Canada. And we see on my grandmother's grave, we went to the Prithvi Raj Road Cemetery today because my grandmother's buried there. I was nine when she was buried. And I took it to, I took my sister to see that grave today. And on that grave are the words that I didn't know then of my grandmother, which said, because I live, you should live also. And the words of Jesus in 1419, because I live, you also shall live. For the first time I realized life was more than biological life. Life has that which breeds reality of the purpose you have within your very soul. You can have all the degrees in the world, you can be the brightest mind in the world, but if you don't have the very purpose for which you were created, the sacredness of the image of God, all you are really is what Jean-Paul Sartre would have said, an empty bubble floating on the sea of nothingness. I spoke to 40,000 university students in the first part of this year. 40,000 in a live audience, tens of thousands more. There were over a thousand universities represented in that audience. I was talking to your principal about this earlier on. When they came forward for counseling and for help, there were two questions that were number one and number two out of these university students responding. Number one question was how to get out uh, from the scourge of pornography. And number two, how to keep from wanting to kill themselves. I don't know this sort of connection. Pornography denudes the other, devalues the other. Suicide ultimately devalues yourself. That your life has no essential purpose or no essential meaning. Intrinsic worth is the imperative that comes to us from the created order. But more than that, we have reflective splendor. There is a generality that we share with humankind, but there's a particularity we have within the microcosm of a family or of friendships, or an institution, or relationships. We share with each other the image of God, but there is a particular value to you. There are people today for almost all of you who care more about you particularly than anyone else in this room because of the relationship they have. And in the plan of God, we can have that economy of essential worth and a reflective splendor. 
My son, uh, Nathan, graduated from Taylor University in Indiana. A few years ago in 2006, Taylor University had a huge tragedy. A few of the students had gone out for the weekend on some work week or something, coming back with members of the staff on a Sunday. They were driving late in the evening and an errant truck driver, a huge, a huge truck, crossed over the median and crashed into them, killed almost all of them in that van. And funerals were held, one after another, for days on end. It's the worst nightmare of a parent to get a telephone call from the administration that your child has been killed in an accident or some such thing. And so the funerals were held, but one of the girls survived, Laura Van Ren. And her parents stood by her bedside, but she was badly, her hair matted, her face distorted and puffed up. She was so badly bruised. Her boyfriend and her parents were by her bedside day after day after day after day, till gradually the mind was gaining coherence again. And she was answering their questions, but they were not pleased with the answers. The boyfriend finally said, you know what, There's something wrong. She's not making any sense. The father said, what do you think? She's been hit by a truck. He said, no, there's something wrong with her answers. And one day when they look at her and keep, uh, keep calling her uh, by the name Laura, she says, why do you call me Laura? He said, because you're Laura Van Ren. She said, no, I'm not. I'm Whitney. I'm Whitney Serac. I'm not Laura Van Ren. Father breathes a huge sigh and calls the office administrator and says, was there any student in the van by the name of Whitney Serac? They said, yes, but she's been buried. I said, no, you better call the coroner. Find out if he did the DNA, the ones that he buried. And the answer was no, he hadn't. And the coroner instantly lost his job. The one in the bed was actually Whitney Serac. She wasn't Laura Van Ren. The one buried was Laura Van Ryn under the grave marker, Whitney Serac. Serac family is called to come back, but their daughter is really alive. And the Van Ryns go to the grave site to do a service all over again and change the marker on the grave to their daughter's name. You have a name and a particularity to who you are. And if I could just convince you young people of one thing, that God has a purpose for your life. He gives you a platform. He gives you a mind. He gives you all the ability that you have. And he will surprise you again and again and again. If you will only follow the path to which he has called you, he will give you the greatest thrills and the greatest blessings you can ever dream of. And so your days as a student should be given over to the discipline, to the best of preparation, for the best of purposes, to fulfill your calling as an individual. Don't envy anyone else. Be the person that God has called you to be. And hardwired you to be that individual. There's an intrinsic worth and a reflective splendor. And I say to you, the Judeo-Christian worldview is steeped in these realities. You're created in the image of God to glorify God. And you have a reflective splendor as a member of God's family and an individual value that is yours and yours alone. Number two, not only is there one in creation, there is a second uniqueness in the incarnation. And the incarnation of Jesus Christ where the word becomes flesh and dwells among us full of grace and truth. And what we are given to that as the imperatives then is that there's an absoluteness of the moral law and there's the supremacy of love. The absoluteness of the moral law and the supremacy of love. I've had the privilege of speaking to lawmakers all over the world. In fact, just before coming here, I was speaking in Boise, Idaho at the governor's prayer breakfast and then took the flight to head on to Delhi. And there they were gathered, about 1,600 of them. And I raised a question for them, and I said this. I say to many political leaders, we brag about the fact that we are a nation of laws. You hear it in America again and again. We are a nation of laws. We are a nation of laws. We are a nation of laws. Then the trunk becomes the political structure. Nation of laws, trunk becomes the political structure. And have you seen what's happening in politics lately? A bellman at the hotel I'm staying in was walking me out and I stay there all the time. He says, Raviji, 
what do you think of what's happening in the politics in the United States? I said, I've lived there for 40 years. I've never seen it in such a mess. I've never heard such vitriolic language and abusive language. Do you know what the bellman said? He said, Nay, Saab, Asana here. It's not the politicians, it's the people who elect them. He's right. He's right. I wanted to pause and tell him, do you know how donkeys fight and how horses fight? When horses fight, they form a circle. They face each other, and when the enemy comes, they kick the enemy from the back like that. When donkeys fight, they also form a circle, but they turn their backs to each other and face the enemy. And when the enemy is coming, they kick each other to death. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what is happening. We become like donkeys. So I say to the political leaders, and there's silence when I say it, we're a nation of laws. The trunk is the politics. The branches are the culture, right? We got it right? They say, yeah. I said, what is the moral soil that holds the laws together? If you don't have the moral soil, nothing good will come out of it. Our laws will reflect an amoral or an immoral society. You see, the Canadian philosopher who's an atheist, Guy Nielsen, makes this comment about morality. We have not been able to show that reason requires the moral point of view, or that really rational persons, unhoodwinked by myth or ideology, need not be individual ego, egoists or classical amoralists. No, reason doesn't decide here. <coughs> the picture I have painted for you is not a pleasant one. Reflection on this actually depresses me. Pure, practical reason, even with a good knowledge of the facts, will not take you to morality. Do you hear what he's saying? This is an atheist saying, reason doesn't decide here. Pure, practical reason will not take you to morality. Why? Because some man on some desert land somewhere can take a sword and chop off another person's head and believe he's doing a very moral thing. If there's no objective point of reference, where do we find our answers? Young people, you're living in that kind of a world. You're living in a world where the media and entertainment control so much of the imagination. And if you take politics and entertainment together, we are at the high seas without chart or compass. There are no answers. There are only a lot of questions. One of the African presidents said to me after I'd spoken to them, he put his arm in mine. I won't name him, but as you're walking away, he looked at me and he said, Mr. Zacharias, he said, we needed to hear what you had to say to us today because I'll tell you something, sir. And I promise you I'm quoting him now. This is exactly what he said. Our cumulative wisdom is unable to meet the daunting challenges of our time. Our cumulative wisdom is unable to meet the daunting challenges of our time. The answers are going to have to come from young minds like yours because there are no answers out there. And my question to you is, what is the moral soil that you are nurturing now? What moral framework will you bring to bear upon the decisions you make, not only in the future, but right now? One of the great institutions of this world is this very one. If we don't produce young graduates with answers, there's very little hope left for the future. And so I'm grateful to God for men and women who lead your institution, who are here to serve you, to help you find a moral framework, that moral law has to be there to hold the laws itself, the moral soil, and then we build the trunk and then the branches. Otherwise, we will see what is happening today, the collapse of the home, the breakdown of everything. And if you were to talk to an average young person today, they will tell you life has become devoid of meaning completely. You don't only really go with the absoluteness of the moral law, you go with the supremacy of love. Love is the longing of the human heart, the embrace, the consummate expressions, the love for a child, the love for a spouse, the love of friendship. It all has to hang on the peg of the love for God. If you don't understand God's love, you will never be able to understand the other loves. See, in the Greek, there are four words for love. 
Agape, storge, phileo, eros. Agape, the love of God. Storge, protective of parental love. Phileo, friendship love. Eros, romantic love. The second three, the last three loves hang on the peg of agape, the love of God, and the vertical dimension. I have three children. Sarah's the oldest, Naomi, my number two, and Nathan, my youngest. And Naomi, our second one, works in rescuing women from sex trafficking industries all over the world. She's an amazing kid. When she started to work in that position, she actually gave up a job at the White House. When I gave her a call and I said, I have a burden, a passion to help the weak of this society, to rescue men, young boys and men and women from sex trafficking, to help the destitute. She gave that job up and she came to take this, this position with us in our Atlanta office. She covers the globe for us in generating resources for the rescue of people of that. She has three beautiful children. Her oldest is Jude. He's an amazing little boy. Now I know I'm talking about my grandson. <laughs> Corporal once said to Winston Churchill, Mr. Churchill, have I ever told you about my grandchildren? Churchill said, no, and I want you to know how much I appreciate it. But since I'm not Churchill, I'll be happy to tell you a story about my grandchildren. <laughs> this little guy, I don't know where he gets his vocabulary from. It's only four. A few months ago, we're sitting around a table having dinner, and he looks at me and he says, Papa, what is the meaning of sophomoric? <laughs> what is the meaning of sophomoric? <laughs> From a three and a half year old kid? I betrayed my own sophomoric knowledge by trying to define it with him. Now he uses it in sentences all the time. So, Mommy, I have this boy in my class who's sophomoric. <laughs> Doesn't know what he's talking about, but he thinks he does. So one day, Naomi, his mother, is running around the house. She can't find her car keys. She slaps her forehead and says, I must be losing my mind. And Jude comes in front of her. Remember, he's about three and a half at that time. Comes in front of her, looks at her, and says, Mommy, whatever you do, please don't ever lose your heart, because I'm in there. <laughs> whatever you do, don't ever lose your heart, because I'm in there. Just today, I got a letter from one of the governors in the United States because her son has become a big fan of our radio programs and has written to me asking for some books and CDs and DVDs. Here's the mother, who's the governor of a state. First thing in the morning, three letters in a row. Ravi, how can I thank you for what you have done for my son? How can I thank you for what you have done for my son? And then two letters followed, immediately one after another. And as I wrote to the governor and I just thanked the governor for those kind words, I'm a father of three and I know how much my children mean to me. This loving relationship is a God-given indication of God's love for you. I spoke to the UN once on a search for absolutes. I said, what are the absolutes you look for? Evil, justice, love, forgiveness. Evil, justice, love, forgiveness. How do we define evil? How do we define love? How do we define justice? And we blow it. When is it legitimate to offer forgiveness? And the UN ambassadors are sitting there listening to this, but they are leaning forward by now. And I have three or four minutes left, and I say to them, can you tell me where in one geographical area of the world these four intersected? Set on a hill called Calvary, where the evil in the heart of man was shown, where the love of God was demonstrated, where justice was honored and forgiveness offered. After it was over, the ambassadors were lined up, and one of them comes up to me, and he said, Mr. Zacharias, I come from an atheistic country. I hate being here. I didn't want to be here, but my president asked me to come here. And I've often wondered why I came here, and today I have my answer. I came here in order to find God. Will you please pray with me? That's what he said. So you've got creation, but beyond the creation, you've got the incarnation. Thirdly and quickly, transformation. This is what you and I ultimately long for. Who's going to change my heart? Who's going to lead me into a different way of thinking? 
I'll give you a quick illustration of this and then close with my final thought and give you a chance for questions. The, dirty, the deadliest prison in America is in Louisiana. It's called Angola Prison. Over 6,000 prisoners, 85% of them are on life without parole. 45 on death row. I've had the privilege of speaking there a couple of times. When the warden took over that prison, it was such a dangerous prison. There, were, there was blood on the ceilings, blood on the walls, blood on the floors. And the chaplain, the warden, went to the governor and he said, allow me to run this place and I'll do it my way and I'll make this the safest prison in America. The governor said, what are you going to do? He said, just leave it with me, allow me to do it my way. So the warden puts a Bible in every cell. He starts conducting Bible studies. He starts holding chapel. He opens a seminary inside the prison where 90 students at any given moment are registered with Masters of Divinity. They're never getting out, but they're studying for the pastoral ministry. He said, we've changed this prison from a gang of thugs to a gang of pastors. <laughs> <laughs> they now cook the meals in the prison. Imagine faith the warden has in eating the meals that the prisoners are making. <laughs> Three of my colleagues, my traveling associate Thomas goes with me, we had lunch with the prisoners. They make the lunch, they serve the lunch, they sit down and have lunch with you. And one of them who had provided the music, I said to him, are you here on life without parole? He said, yes, sir. I said, you're never gonna get out? He said, no, sir. I said, can you tell me something? How do you feel? How do you feel? But you're never getting out. He said, Mrs. Zacharias, if you knew why I'm here, you would never ask me that question. <laughs> he said, I'm here for a very horrific crime. But because I came to this prison, he said, I found salvation and I found redemption in Jesus Christ. He said, for the first time in my life, I'm really free. He said, pray for my parents. They're outside, they think they're free, but they're really living in chains. As somebody said, the worst effect of sin is manifested not in pain or suffering or bodily defacement, but in the discrowned faculties, the unworthy loves, the low ideals, the brutalized and the enslaved spirit. And so I say to you, the answer that the gospel gives to you and me is that our greatest need is that of a savior. Our greatest need is that of forgiveness. Our greatest need is that of a changed heart. That's what it means to be human in the Judeo-Christian worldview. You've got creation, incarnation, transformation, and lastly, consummation. Why in the world are we here anyway? Do you know what is the meaning of university? You're in a university. Do you know what the meaning is? The meaning of university comes to us from the Greeks for a question they never answered. They could never find unity in diversity. How do we find unity in diversity? So they start with the universities. <laughs> <laughs> to find unity in diversity is Ezekiel Ahema. That's why you're here. To find unity in diversity. If I dare to suggest it, most of us will graduate from pluriversity. We will not have anything to unify our knowledge unless you are listening carefully to the beautiful words of the songs that the musicians were singing to worship you. Archbishop William Temple said, worship is the submission of all of our nature to God. It's the quickening of conscience by His holiness, nourishment of mind by His truth, purifying of imagination by His beauty, opening of the heart to His love, and submission of will to His purpose. All this gathered up in adoration is the greatest expression of which we are capable. Quickening of conscience by his holiness, mind by his truth, imagination by beauty, heart to his love and will to his purpose. All this gathered up in adoration is the greatest expression of which we are capable. He will never find unity in diversity on the outside until he find unity in the diversity within. How do you find that? To bind it together in the sacred to bind it together in the sacred. You know, I had a classmate in Toronto when I was studying there, and in the psychology class, one day they had us sit down together, two at a time. I don't know why they ever did this, never solved any problems, but they did it. <laughs> you had to sit down two together, and one day the 
ex the experiment in class was that each one had to tell the other person that they were rich. What is the worst thing about them? And then what is the best thing about them? Now once you've heard the worst, you're really not listening to the best. <laughs> so this guy, he's in the classroom and we're walking out of there, I picked up my bags and going to the mail room to pick up my mail and he is fighting mad. I said, what's your problem? What's going on? He said, do you know what he said to me? Do you know what the guy said to me is the worst thing about me? I said, what's that? He said, I do not know how to take criticism. <laughs> And the louder he shouted, the more he was proving it. <laughs> but I dare not tell him that. Because I'm not going to get anywhere. Margaret said, human depravity is that once the most empirically verifiable fact, at the same time that it is the most intellectually resistant. Human depravity is the most empirically verifiable fact at the same time that it is the most intellectually resistant. We fight it intellectually, we know it existentially. A guy at uh, which university was it? It's on YouTube, I forget which one it was. I think it was uh, UPenn was it? I can't remember, uh, either there or Princeton somewhere. This guy comes up to the microphone and he's, he, he says to me, he's, he's, he's arguing, raising, he said, why are you guys so hung up on absolutes? You may have seen it on the YouTube. Why are you so hung up on absolutes? Why would you go for relativism? So I said to him, do you lock your doors at night? He stops and he grins. He said, yeah. I said, why? Are you afraid that your neighborhood has absolutists or relativists? <laughs> He walks away. Your heart, my heart, is desperately wicked. We need a savior. And when you see the answers of Jesus to the questions of man, what is there in man that you're mindful of him? Or the son of man that you visit him, says the son the psalmist. When I see the heavens, the work of your hands, the sun and the moons that you made, what is there in man that you're mindful of him? Or the son of man that you visit him? You see, you can admire the moon but the moon will never return the compliment. <laughs> Why? You are made in the image of God with that volition and moral reasoning. Creation, incarnation, transformation, consummation. That is my answer to what it means to be a human being given to me by my Lord and my Savior. God bless you. Thank you for giving me a hand. Thank you, sir. It was an absolute privilege to listen to the evening. Now we'll have the question and answer series. I request all of you to take the mics. The volunteers are around. They have mics. You can ask for the mics if you have any questions. Yeah. And before that, I would request all of you to fill the feedback form which has been provided to you. The volunteers would be collecting it at the end of the session. The question. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, this is uh, the second talk that I am attending of yours. The first talk that I happened to attend of yours live was uh, titled as Storing Dignity in a, Different, in a Declining Culture. That was held, uh, I think, last to last year. It's a privilege here to meet you. Um, my, my question is, uh, sir, you talked about uh, the importance of worship, and I think the definition given by the Archbishop clearly uh, explains the importance of worship. Now, I, being a Christian, um, believe that believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. Now, a few of my Muslim friends have, uh, have had this discussion with me and uh, they agree with all the, near, near about all the, uh, the, the essential things uh, about Jesus, like they acknowledge his virgin birth. They even acknowledge the fact that Jesus referred, him, referred to himself with the titles, with some of those titles that are exclusively uh, uh, that exclusively uh, denote God, 
like the I am, for example. Now, given all those things, uh, how 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 is it? Um, how can it be really convincing for them to understand that Jesus demands worship, or does he demand worship? Because nowhere in the Bible do we find that Jesus explicitly demands worship. This is my question. Yes. Actually, he does. Come back here. I don't like the term demands worship. I would say more elicits or implicitly commands it. The answer to that is, first of all, I think <coughs> there's a many, there are many, many differences between the Islamic worldview and the Judeo-Christian worldview. Long before the worship question, your